ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا انه من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد we continue our sira uh, class uh, every thursday and uh, today we'll talk about many many incidents that happened before the prophethood inshallah this class will be uh, what happened before the prophethood and then we will enter the prophethood in the in in uh, in next week inshallah a war happened uh, at the time before the prophet sallallahu uh, before he re- received the message he was alayhi salatu wasalam 20 years old and there was a war that happened in in the place of quraish they called it the sacrilegious wars the sacrilegious war حروب الفجار in Arabic and sacrilegious meaning that it's showing disrespect to something that is religious why did they call it that? because the wars that happened or occurred they were at the time or the months of Muh- or of Haram شهر الحرم and as we know in Islam شهر الحرم you cannot fight, you cannot battle, you cannot kill anyone. And so the people of Quraysh had battles between tribes at that time. Also the battles took place during the war, this war that happened, it took place in one of the most sacred, the most sacred place on the planet which is Mecca. And the war was between many tribes. One of them was Quraysh, Banu Kinana, were on one side and on the other side was uh, other tribes from uh, from different other tribes in in this region and it was narrated that the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam participated in a way in that wars in these wars wars but these uh, these narrations were not authentic these narrations were not authentic they said that the Prophet ﷺ used to prepare the arrows for, for the people who are going to battle. And some even said that the Prophet ﷺ used to collect the arrows from the battlefield and bring them back to the, uh, to the fighters or to the people who are, who are fighting. This was, of course, 20 years old. Uh, he didn't, he didn't um, participate physically and to, to fight. So this was his... Um, his task. But like I said, this is not authentic. They say it is not authentic. After this, there was a treaty that happened. They call it Hilf al-Fudul. Al-Fudul confederacy. Confederacy or treaty uh, between two sides. And subhanAllah, in Hilf al-Fudul, it happened because of one man. It happened because of one, one man. This man, he was a merchant from Zubayd, from the clan of Zubayd. He came from Yemen and he came to Quraysh having some merchandise, selling. And he sold to a man called Al-As ibn Wa'il, Al-Sahimi. When he sold to him, this person, al as he did not give him his money. I don't want to give you your money. Back then, there was no police, there was no government. What are you going to do? It's like a jungle. The strong eats the weak. And so this man was very, very upset. He went to some of the tribes of Quraysh. I'm here trying to seek some... Yani, trying to invest in trade and get some money. And this man is not giving me my money. I mean, I sold him something. Can any of you help and interfere to help me get my money back? Uh, nobody gave him any attention. And they did not react to his plea. And so, Az-Zubair ibn Abd al-Muttalib. Az-Zubair ibn Abd al-Muttalib made inquiries into the matter. And he said, what's going on? He said, so and so happened. 
and uh, this man is asking for, for his money. Before that, the man went on top of a mountain and he started complaining. He started saying, uh, you know, poetry, shi'r, bait. He started saying poetry that I came to this place, a sacred place, and I'm here to trade and make money. And this is what you, you people do to me. I ask people to give me my rights. And so Zubair ibn Abdul Muttalib was very upset to this and he said, we have to, we have to do something about this. Quraysh in a place that is sacred around the Kaaba in Mecca and people are being uh, you know, unjust and there is transgression and oppression there. We cannot have that. What will we do? They said, we have to have a treaty. The tribes of Quraysh have to have a treaty. And the representative they were, uh, of the tribes were from Banu Hashim and Banu Abdul Muttalib and uh, Asad ibn Abdul Uzza wa Zahra ibn Kilab wa Taym ibn Murra were all called to the meeting in the house of one of the elders of Quraysh, Abdullah ibn Jad'an at taymi Abdullah ibn Jad'an at taymi And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam witnessed this treaty when all the elders came and everybody gathered in the house of Ibn Jad'an. The Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasallam was there when he was young. At a later stage in Islam, the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasallam said, if this treaty took place in Islam and I was invited to it, I would still come. And this shows us that one of the, uh, yani, uh, from the wisdom of the Prophet and the tolerance of Islam, sometimes we even deal and support non-Muslims in things that are beneficial and things that are haq, as it happened here in the treaty of Al-Fudul. So what was the treaty about? They said we all gather as tribes that we seek justice to anybody who is oppressed or anybody who has experienced injustice, zulm, or any oppression or transgression, we will support him and defend him and take his rights back. Whether he is from Quraysh or not from Quraysh, we will still يعني, stand up for the oppressed. And this shows us something, dear brothers and sisters. That SubhanAllah, we humans, يعني, we cannot be left alone to judge and make standards and live by it universally. This doesn't have, it cannot work. What I'm saying is that you have to have order in life and you have to have somebody of authority to legislate to you the, what is right and what is wrong. You have to have that. If you don't have that, we will be like a jungle. And this is subhanAllah, some of the countries today, they are not countries, I mean, maybe, but, but groups of people, ideologies that are coming up that are new. They're saying we need absolute freedom in life. Liberalism, freedom. I want to be the judge of everything in life. I am the judge of everything. You cannot have that. And I've seen some videos, subhanAllah, I, I suppose these are rare incidents, but they are uh, growing. In some countries you see groups of people going into a supermarket or a shop or anything like that and taking what they want and leaving. And the police are not doing anything. They say this is part of uh, the freedom of choice or part of the freedom of, of citizens. They can take something and not pay. What injustice in this is this? What, is, what kind of injustice is this? Have we as humans developed through now time, millions of years, they say, we have developed into this. This is what our intellect have reached to, that we have become like a jungle. Subhanallah. This is, not, this is not how humans can live. This is not what we call civilization. Civilization is when we have order in a society, in peace, and adil, justice, and everybody takes his rights. Nobody can do that and apply that without authority. If you don't have authority, khalas. No safety, no religion, Nobody can even live anymore. Anybody can come into your house 
and take your money, take everything, take even your wife, may Allah preserve all our family members, and kill you and leave. Who's going to stop him? Nobody. And this is why what we have experienced and seen, may Allah preserve all the Muslimin around the world, in the Arab Spring. When they nullified authority. Of course, with regards to other corruptions and things like that, I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about even with corruption, there was authority. Now they removed authority and the corruption stayed. Corruption was removed? No, it wasn't. So what happened? This is what happened. So this gives us the importance of order uh, in, in societies. طيب. After this hilf, yeah, and things went smoothly in Quraysh and the tribes people were taking care of everything, uh, standing up for the, for the oppressed and all that. The Prophet والسلام, at the age of 25, what was his job? A shepherd. Ra'i ghanam. Abu Talib, his, his uncle came to the Prophet والسلام, and as you know, he was his guardian. He lived with him. He said, I am poor and I cannot take care of you now. You're 25, mashallah. You're a grown man. You should يعني, start seeking some investment or income. Go and seek work. So the Prophet والسلام, was a shepherd, worked as a shepherd for some of the tribes in Quraysh uh, from Bani Sa'ad and in, Mac and, and in Mecca for wages. And Subhanallah, the ulama, there's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ said, No prophet was given prophethood except he was a shepherd. Prophets were shepherds. It was narrated that Musa was a shepherd. And also other prophets, I think it was Isa also. Isa was not, they, they, they said he was a carpenter, but he wasn't a carpenter. Najjar, he wasn't. That the, the correct saying, Wallahu ta'ala alam, is that he was also a shepherd. Isa, Jesus, alayhi salam, and other prophets. The ulama said that there is hikmah, wisdom, into putting prophets or making prophets work as shepherds before they, they receive their prophethood. One of the things they said, they are training, it's like a training camp for the prophets, alayhi salam, to lead and to take care of others. Because you know as a shepherd, you have to take care of the sheep and feed them and protect them and all that. So it was like a training, like a, uh, what do you call it? Uh, a simulation. You know how we, when we, the, the pilots, when they want to become a pilot, before becoming a pilot, they give them into a simulation, a game, as if they're virtually flying a, a plane to train them. SubhanAllah, this is perhaps the same thing, the same concept. Number two, they said that shepherds will gain mercy and tolerance because they're protecting, they're feeding, they have to take care of these sheep. Yeah, so it teaches them some tolerance, some patience, some mercy. Number three, they said that the sheep are known for weakness and division. The sheep, what do you call a, a group of sheep? Flock, huh? Flock, good, I forgot subhanAllah, I need to brush up my English. The flock of sheep, subhanAllah, not, not like uh, the camels. Camels are always together. Sheep, no. They, they run around, they play and they go around. So you really have to take care of them and put them back into the group. And they're very weak. A wolf, anything can come and grab them and go or eat them or attack them. So it teaches, it teaches that how to take care of the weak. And the, and the helpless, and the needy. And this is something very important when you are a leader. The fourth is that it has profit from your own hard work. And in one hadith, the Prophet wasallam said, no one would eat a better food except from what he has earned from his, from his own effort or his own hand. That's why some of the ulama, they mentioned this, that this hadith is evident that uh, trade, or being business, you know, having your own business or investment is better than working as an employee. It's better as barakah, but as you know, it's very hard. Not, not anybody's cut out to this. We some, I think most of us here are employees because it's safe pay 
and we don't want to risk <laughs> the business. Business is very risky nowadays. But inshallah, barakah and everything as long as it's halal. But this is what the hadith has, has mentioned. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was a shepherd. Then at the, at the age of 25 also still, Khadija radiallahu anha, as we all know that she was the first wife of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. Let's talk about how they met. Let's talk about how they met. Khadija was a businesswoman, an entrepreneur, as we say today in today's yani, terminology. And she was, uh, she was a, pers- a, a woman of great wisdom and a great personality. And she was chaste and modest. And she was known about, uh, among the nobles. Her lineage, her tribe was a noble tribe. And so, and she had, she was rich. She, she was a rich woman. Now, Khadija used to have a lot of money and she used to, what we call it today, mudaraba. As in, and we do it today even in business. You investor, investors or investing. She would give her money to someone she trusts or she had a deal with. She tells him, take my money and do some tijara. Do some trade in it and give me back. You take a percentage and I take a percentage. They agree on it. And this was the deal with Khadija. She used to hire some men to do that for her. And she was always complaining that they wouldn't come back with a good investment. The income, the, turn, the, the, the return on investment was not very high. Sometimes it's not high because of the person was not competent. Sometimes the people would steal something from her. And she's a woman. It's difficult. Then she heard of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa That he was honest and reliable and uh, really good with business, with, with taking care of money. I mean, anybody would trust him. Very trustworthy man. So she said, okay, let's talk to him and let's have a deal with him. So she said that, uh, she met him and she said, because of your honesty and all that, I want to give you money and any uh, percentage, whatever percentage, I will double it. I used to give so and so for the men, I will make it double for you. If you get me something, an investment that is good. So he agreed. And she sent him to Syria. She sent him to Syria with another person. That's her servant. His name was Maysara. And they went to Syria for trade. While they were there, there was a story that happened while he was doing trade with one of the people. The story was, يعني, they don't, because you know, in Sira, not every story or incident has to be 100% authentic. Because it's a story, there's no tashri' in it. So sometimes even weak narrations, they will accept. What happened is that during the time when the Prophet ﷺ was in Syria doing trade, there was a big, bit of a conflict between him and another person who was buying. Yes, you paid, you didn't pay, something happened, uh, argument that they didn't agree on. And there was a right that the Prophet said, this is mine, and the other person disagreed, said, no, this is my right, and so on. So the man told the Prophet, he knows that he was from Mecca. And he knows the people of Quraysh. So he said, if you're truthful, then swear by the Lat and the Uzza. He said, I don't swear by these. And I never swore by these. These are not things that I swear upon. They don't deserve me swearing upon that. Subhanallah. And the man, when he saw, he saw this, he, he was shocked. He said, these people, you know, they're people of idols. They always swear by these things. So he's like, it's, it's as if the man said, I trust you. What you say is the truth because you said that and you can take uh, yani, uh, the money or, or he agreed that it is, it is his rights. Subhanallah, this also tells us the blessings of Tawheed and swearing by other than Allah even before Islam was there. Swearing by other than Allah, as you know in Islam, it is forbidden. It is shirk. The Prophet sallallahu said in one hadith, من حلف بغير الله فقد أشرك Whoever swears by other than Allah, then he has committed polytheism. Meaning that you have associated something with Allah. طبعاً the ulama, they said, that doesn't, this doesn't take you out of the folds of Islam, but definitely it is even worse than major sins, by default, by nature. And now today we say people, I swear by my mother's life. 
I swear by my life. I swear by the Kaaba. All this is shirk. It's not allowed. If you want to swear and you are forced to swear, you say, Wallahi, by Allah, not by the Prophet, not by the Kaaba, not by your mother life or your mother or your father or you or this is all shirk. So we have to be aware of that. Tayyib. Now when he came back and as you know in the story of Halima al-Sa'diyya, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was Mubarak. He was a blessed man alayhi salatu wasalam. He was as a baby and Halima al-Sa'diyya's milk would flow and feed him and feed his brother also. And when he was around things, things will always flourish and be positive and everything will increase in goodness. So he came back with a lot of profit. Khadija was so happy. So she gave him what, what he, he deserves and she, she took what she deserves. At that time, Khadija was a divorcee. She married two people before. Uh, and uh, one of them is uh, uh, Atiq ibn Aid, and she had three children from him. Sorry, two, a son and a daughter. And another one was Abu Hala ibn Malik bin Bani Tamim, also married her and divorced her. And she had three kids from him. And at that time, she had a friend called Nafisa. There was a narration, also not authentic, but she was sitting at the first floor of her house. This is also evident that they used to have two floors, two-story houses back then. So she was sitting at the top floor or the first floor and there's a ground floor. She was sitting on top and she was looking and she saw Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, the Prophet, coming back with the, with the ibel and the ibel and the camel and, the, and all the, uh, you know, the, the stuff with him, the merchant, the merchandise. She saw two angels flying and covering him as a shade. Two things flying, she noticed that it is an angel. She said it's an angel. So she, she, she told her friends, look, look, look what I'm seeing. They were all amazed. How is this possible? And as you know, when he was a child, when he went to Syria also, everything would prostrate for him. The trees and the stones, they saw that about him. So anyways, he entered and she welcomed him. She took everything. He gave her the share and he left. She was telling her friend Nafisa. Yani Muhammad والسلام, was a good man. Very honest, very trustworthy. Mashallah, I see him, very respectful person, modest. Like, yani, it would be nice if he would marry me. It would be nice for him to be my husband. Nafisa said, leave it to me. She went to Muhammad and she told him, Ya Muhammad, mashallah, you're a good person, you're well off. How about yani, you have good, good character, everybody would, would want you as, as a husband. Why don't you get married? So he said, Wallahi, I don't have any money. I'm not that well off. I'm still building myself. He was, what's his age? 25. Still young. Today, 25-year-old in this day, I think he will not even have one dirham. Maybe even in debt, Aslan. <laughs> but the Prophet was yani, trying to make some money for him. Responsibilities, man. You have to. You're a man, you have to. Even at the age of 18, you have to think about these things and invest. Anyway, so Nafis was telling him, don't worry about that. How about I give you a, I have a woman for you who is of great lineage, of beauty, of money, of respect, of personality, of everything. Would you, would you accept it? She said, of course, who wouldn't? She said, Khadija. So he's like, as if he's, he's saying, as if he's saying, yani she's, I cannot marry her. She's, mashallah, well off and a businesswoman. It's as if in today, well, teenagers, they say she's out of my league. Alayhi salatu wasalam, taban, never. He is, he is our prophet, imamuna, wa sayyid al-alameen. But yani he's, the revelation didn't reach to him and this is from his humility, subhanAllah, and his modesty. 
So she said, no, she will accept. I'm her friend, go for it. He was okay, fine. So he called his uncle, uh, Abu, Abu Talib, and they went to the house of, of uh, the family of Khadija, and her father didn't, wasn't alive. She was also at the guardianship of her uncle. And he came and he said, our son, Muhammad, he wants to marry your Karima. We, oh, we say that in Arabic, even till today we say it, Karimatukum. Karimatukum means, Karima means what? Uh, kindness or something that is good in al karama something that is of high value or high honor so we say your honor is يعني, meaning your daughter out of respect and courtesy coming here asking to, to for the hand of of uh, of your honor your daughter and our and always when we come and propose you always have to praise your son our son, mashallah, he is good, he is trustworthy, everybody knows him, his reputation is good, mashallah. But always, dear brothers, inshallah, when you have sons and you want to propose, don't lie. Don't say my son is the best and all that, and he has a crime record of I don't know what. No, don't do that. This is amana. This is lying. Yeah? Say what's truthful. Raise him properly, and then when you go and present him, present him with truth that he is good, and you vouch for him. It's very important. Today people say, Wallah, he is the best person. Doesn't leave the masjid. He doesn't even know the Fatiha. No, this is cheating. Anyways, so in one narration, he, they presented, uh, it was narrated that he presented, Wallah ta'ala alam, uh, if I remember correctly, I haven't noted it down. Actually, I have. 20 camels as dori. Uh, you call it do mahar. Dori, right? Yeah. 20 camels as her. Mahar. In another narration, they said he gave her 500 dirhams, not Emirati dirhams. Dirhams back then meaning uh, silver coins. Dinar is gold. Dirham is silver. At that time, what it was equivalent to, I did a lot of calculation, took me half an hour. Allah Ta'ala, I could be wrong. Around equivalent to 1,500 dirham today. That was her mahar. And this is يعني, a message to all the parents of women to fear Allah Azza wa Jal. And to make it, to, to simplify marriage for the poor brothers who are trying to seek halal. Today many brothers, because of the fitan, they want to marry. And they want to marry young. And wallahi there is no shame in that. Seeking the halal and they are trying to take responsibility and get into life and marriage. يعني, we as fathers should be يعني, mindful of this and help out and support these, these uh, brothers. Of course, inshallah, that they are in good manners and good people eligible to marry your daughters, support them. And wallahi, it is not Islamic to ask people for things that they cannot afford as mahar. Some people ask 100,000, 200,000, 300,000 as a mahar. And wallahi, this is un-Islamic. Yani the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in one hadith, he said, the most blessed of marriages are the most simple ones, the simplest of marriages. There's another hadith they said, um, uh, I think it was uh, or something like that. This is a weak narration, but the, the hadith that I, I have read that is authentic is that um, is أيس أفضل أفضل النكاح أقله أيسره أيسره والله تعالى أعلم أو كما قيل Anyway, so uh, this is what Islam always tells us to be. Simplify things, to make things easy for everyone, not to exaggerate, not to overspend on these things. طيب, so they got married. There are two narrations about the age of Aisha. Actually more than two, but this is the most accurate, two accurate. One, one narration they said that Aisha was 45 years old. She was 45 and the Prophet was 25. Sorry, sorry, Khadija. Thank you, thank you. By the way, if I make a mistake in something, please tell me. The other time I was talking about the year of the elephant, I said the year of the camel. There's no such thing. There's no year of the camel. There's year of the elephant. I get mixed up sometimes. Sorry, yeah? Thank you. <laughs> Khadija. Khadija was, they said at one age was 40. Another narration was 45. 
And another narration, Wallahu ta'ala a'lam, is the correct one. She was 35. 35. There's a nice book that has such things and it's something that is eye-opening. It's called, the book is titled, it's called Ma Sha'a Walam Yathbut Fi Sira. Ma Sha'a Walam Yathbut Fi Sira. What was spread and was not authentic in the Sira. And he mentions a lot of things about the Sira that everybody knows, but it's actually not true. One of the things he said is the age of Khadija and not Aisha. Khadija. Anyways, regardless, 35, 40, they got married. We all know this. Khadija radiallahu anha gave birth to all of the children of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, except one, except Ibrahim. She gave birth to first Al-Qasim, his son. And that's why the Prophet, his kunya, his nickname, or we call it kunya, is Abu Al-Qasim. Abu Al-Qasim, because he was his eldest son. But he passed away when he was still a newborn, a baby. First, she gave birth to Al-Qasim. ثم زينب ثم رقية ثم أم كلثوم ثم فاطمة ثم عبد الله All of them died during the time of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم except for فاطمة She died uh, six months after the death of the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام عبد الله is the only one or sorry he Yes, he was the only one who was born after the revelation. He was born in Islam. And that's why one of his nicknames was At-Tayyib At-Tahir. At-Tayyib At-Tahir. But of course, as you know, Abdullah also died and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam buried him when he was still a newborn. Now, <clears throat> Zainab radiallahu anha was the eldest. And she married her cousin, Abu al-As. Then comes Ruqayya. And she married Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu an. She died during the battle of Badr. Ruqayya. After her death, Uthman radiallahu an married her sister, Um Kulthum. And then of course Fatima, as we know, she married Ali radiallahu an. And, uh, and she died around the age of 29 the age of 29 now after that time the marriage happened with Khadija radiallahu anha something happened when the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was 35 35 years old Quraysh saw that the Kaaba how much time do we have? Five minutes, Allahu Akbar. We might continue after uh, Adhan Shwaya. The Kaaba was getting old, as any building. And you know the Kaaba was the first masjid on the planet that Ibrahim built. It was the first masjid. It was getting old because of, you know, uh, storms and winds and things like that. And also there was a woman who used to come and you know, do bukhur and things around the Kaaba. Just to, you know, as a sacred place, take care of it. And sometimes she would burn the walls of the Kaaba. It would get damaged. So all these things that are happening, and by the way, the Kaaba was nine lengths, nine arms length long. It wasn't very, very big and high. And it was roofless. There was no roof. And sometimes people, as a sign of blessings or seeking blessings, they put things inside. And it had a door. Thieves used to get in and steal things from inside. So this whole situation يعني, wasn't very working very well for the people of, of Quraysh. And like I said, it's getting old. It needs maintenance. So the chiefs of Quraysh gathered. And they said, we need to take care of the Kaaba. We cannot leave it like this. It will just demolish and it will go. And you need to sustain it. So some people said, we'll do some maintenance. And inshallah, it will, يعني, it will be sufficient. Other people said, it's, it's too old. We need to destroy it, demolish it, and then rebuild it again. And these people were the 
the chiefs of Quraysh. They witnessed the year of the elephant 35 years ago. Elders. And they saw what happened to Abraha when he tried to demolish the Kaaba. So they said, no way. We don't want Tyran Ababil to come and destroy us like, they, like it destroyed Kaaba. This is a sacred place and we saw what happened. So let's not demolish it. So Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira, al-Makhzumi, one of the also the wise people of Quraysh, said, what are you talking about? Our intention is that we want to rebuild it, not to destroy it. This man came to destroy it. Different intention, Taban. So they said, don't worry about it. They said, no, 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 no. We're not going to get involved in this. So he took his equipment and he started hitting the Kaaba and trying to destroy it brick by brick. So he said, see, nothing happened. What are you guys scared of? He said, okay, we'll wait until the next day. If nothing happens to you, we'll come and help. And everybody was scared. Imagine now, any moment they're waiting for Tayran Ababil, birds will come and destroy him and destroy yani, the tribe of Walid ibn al-Mughira. He woke up the next day, alhamdulillah, he's fine, nothing happened to him. They said, okay, khalas, we will all help rebuild the Kaaba. The tribes of Quraysh wanted to rebuild the Kaaba, as I said. Now, see, because of their love and the honor and the respect of the Kaaba, and they know this place, the Kaaba, the structure is a sacred place, and they have to respect it and honor it. They said, we will not take any money that is from haram. No money from prostitution, no money from gambling, no money from stealing, no money from any kind of haram we will not take. We will take only halal money and it was so little because people of Quraysh used to always, like I explained before, used to always get involved into haram. And it was whatever money they had, they started working on rebuilding the Kaaba. They were demolishing and rebuilding every uh, tribe. They took one side of the Kaaba and they demolished it and started rebuilding it and working on it. Now, subhanAllah, an incident happened uh, when the Prophet Sallallahu was actually also participating in rebuilding the Kaaba. This is something very unusual. But we have to understand this was, tradition plays a big role in this. You know, people when they go around the Kaaba, men, men, they used to go naked. That is totally fine for them. And uh, they had a reason for it. He said, you know, we're working or sometimes even when they were doing tawaf. You've heard this before. When they do tawaf, going around the Kaaba, they do it naked. Completely. This was back in the Jahiliya times, of course. This is how they used to do it. And there was something perfectly normal for them. Culture, subhanAllah, tradition, how it plays with your mind sometimes. So, the Prophet والسلام, was carrying rocks, heavy things, to the Kaaba. While he was doing that, Al-Abbas, his uncle, told, told him, yani, it's too heavy and all that. Why don't you use your, I don't know what you call it in, in India or in uh, East Asia, lungi, right? Lungi, loincloth. Yeah, izar, we call it izar in Arabic. So he said, remove your izar and put it on your back, shoulders, so you can lift more rocks. So his aura, his private, or yani his aura will show, right? And that was totally normal for them. But subhanAllah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because he is the chosen one, but he doesn't know, his, the revelation didn't come to him. As soon as he did that, he fainted. He passed out. And he got up and he wore his lungi, his loin cloth. He didn't do it. Allah did not allow him to show his aura. Allah is protecting him. Subhanallah. And there was another incident that the Prophet ﷺ occurred in his time. While he was working, he said, I want to, yani, you know, as any young man wants, wants to go and have some fun, entertain himself. So he went to the market in Mecca. And he saw people singing and dancing and music and all that. He didn't know what this is. So he went, what's going on here? So he said, this is a wedding party. So he said, okay, I want to listen. Come and enjoy it. As soon as he sat down, he passed out. Allah did not allow him to listen to the music and the dancing that was happening. He passed out, he woke up, heat, the sun, he didn't know what happened. Subhanallah, this is, يعني, as the Prophet وسلم, said in one hadith to Ibn Abbas, he was teaching him as a young kid. He said, Allah, Be mindful of Allah, have tawheed in your heart, 
and rely on Allah and seek the help of Allah, Allah will protect you. And sometimes we notice these things in our lives. Wallahi, wallahi, sometimes you want to do sharr, you want to do evil. Allah will put boundaries in front of you. And sometimes you don't know that you're doing evil. Later you find, oh, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, Allah got, got, you know, protected me from that thing that I was about to do. And this is, wallahi, it happens in your life. Everybody can be, and you can remember these incidents that happen. So always have that mindfulness of Allah Azza wa Jal and protecting what He ordered you to do, His obedience in your life, in your heart, in your niyyah, in your actions. Wallah, Allah will protect you from many haram. I know many people today, many people, they tell me, Akhi, I'm in a job that has haram. I want to leave it. I want to leave it. I don't know how to. Wallah, if you're mindful of Allah and you seek the halal way in your intention, you're honest, Allah will open doors for you. Wallahi, Allah will open doors. I know one man who used to work in, uh, in properties and the company that he was working in, it had some haram elements. I'm not saying property is haram, but in that company, it had haram elements. They were cheating people, doing some really bad things. And he was, subhanAllah, at that stage, he was still yani, getting closer to Allah and he's like, khalas, I want to be a good Muslim and all that. I don't want this job. And he's, he's telling me that, Wallahi, I used to do dua every night. Just Allah, rid me from this job. Any job, even half pay. I don't want to work here. Half pay, I'm okay with that. And he was married too. Subhanallah, within a month, within a month, the financial crunch happened, you know, in 2009, when everything went down, properties, they started firing everyone. At that time, that company closed down, shut down. It was, it was uh, brought, bought by another company. And he found a job, not... Half the price, double the salary. Double the salary. Allah Allah will give you from where you don't know. Anyways, the point is that be mindful of Allah. Allah, Allah. Allah will open doors for you. So they were building the Kaaba and that incident happened. They finished, but not quite. The money was not enough to build the whole Kaaba as it was. You've been to Mecca, right? Or you've seen at least pictures of Mecca or the Kaaba. You know the Hijr, we call it Hijr Ismail. They, this got nothing to do with Ismail, by the way. Hijr, or they call it the uh, Hijr Ismail, or the demolition of Ismail. It was a place that was, Hijr means something that is demolished. This place was actually part of the Kaaba. The Kaaba was that big. But because they didn't have money, Quraysh did not build it, continue it. So they just put that area there. They said, okay, this is also Kaaba. That's why, you know, when you do Tawaf, you don't go through that. It's not allowed. Your tawaf is not counted. So you have to go around that hijr. But like I said, Ismail got nothing to do with this. This happened because they didn't have any money to rebuild the Kaaba. So they just left it as it is. That's it. So the Kaaba is actually that big. They just built a, a, a part of it. And now look at the hikmah, the wisdom. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told Aisha. Aisha, not Khadija, Aisha. That was after the revelation. He told her, Wallahi, if it wasn't that the qawm, your qawm, your people in Mecca were hadithi ahd bi Islam, that they are new to Islam, I would demolish the Kaaba again and build it with the complete structure of, of Ibrahim and Ismail, the same one. Because as I said, it's not complete. But he said, because they are new to Islam, I'm not going to do that. Because now if I do it, what will happen? This guy coming, new prophet, and now he's destroying the sacred land. What is this? People will talk. Fitna will happen. So sometimes, dear brothers and sisters, sometimes you will see the batil, the falsehood in front of you, and you have to correct it. But ya akhi, it's not the time. Wait. Maybe it takes you a month. Maybe it takes you a year. Maybe it takes you two years. And this is also, this came to my mind. Sometimes a manager, a person of authority, a CEO of a company, he comes and takes over a company or he's new to the people. As soon as he comes, he wants to change. Ya Allah, change this, change that, change. Akhi, wait, shway, 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 shway. People are building this, this, this company for 20, 30 years. Now you come, you want to change everything? Who will accept you? Sah? People will like, like, who are you? And people will question you. People, And this is the Prophet Sallallahu teaching us the best of tactics and wisdom and leadership and in how to change things and change management. There's a whole like program and masters and things now today, they teach it, change management. 
yeah, you learn it from the seerah. Don't learn it from, from the non-Muslims. Wallahi, they will not teach us what's better than the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. So he's, because of wisdom, sometimes leave what is good to avoid what is worse, to avoid what's fitna. The Prophet ﷺ in this hadith, in this moment, he did not do that. He said, I will wait later. Walakin qaddar Allah, Allah willed that. He wasn't able to do it until he did hijrah and all that. And the Prophet passed away without applying it. But it stayed as it is. We don't want to cause fitna. Anyways, so they finished everything and now they are going to put the the Hajar al-Aswad, the black stone, into its place. So all of the tribes said, I will do it. It is our uh, right. It is our right. They started fighting. They started fighting for a couple of days and nobody would solve the problem. What to do, what to do. And everything stopped, khalas. Everyone got angry. You know how Arabs, Bedouins, when, they, when their mind gets locked on something, khalas, nobody can, can talk to them anymore. Then Abu Umayyah ibn Mughira al-Makhzumi. He said to them, he was one of the elders also. He said, listen, let's yeah, and he settle this. The first man who enters in this entrance, we will tell him to decide. Everyone agrees? He said, okay, khalas. everyone agrees. The first man who enters, he will decide and he will be the judge who will carry the black stone and put it in his place. Who entered? The Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, khayrul khalq, wa afdalul khalq, the most wise. He entered and he said, yallah, now you have to decide. What's going on? Wallahi, the black stone and now we are disputing, you decide. And look at the hikmah. He didn't say you or you, no. He got a piece of cloth and he put the hajar in front in, in, in it. And he said, all the tribes, everyone catches one edge or one side of the, of the cloth and carry it and put it into, the, into its place. And of course, at, when they reached there, he, he took it and he placed it in its rightful place. And alhamdulillah, the Prophet sallallahu was a reason and a blessing that he avoided a big fitna that would happen at, at the time of rebuilding the Kaaba. طيب, we will conclude here insha'Allah and insha'Allah in the next week we will talk about the prophethood of, of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and how the revelation came to him. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika ashadu an la ilaha illallah astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk wa jazakumullahu khayra.